Okay, so today we're going to go over voidness or emptiness and the signless. Before I continue, I have three suttas I'm going through, but they're all going to be short. Okay, so don't worry. So the first one is Majjhima Nikaya 121, Chula Sunyata Sutta, the shorter discourse on voidness. Thus have I heard on one occasion the Blessed One was living at Savati in the Eastern Park in the palace of Nirgara's mother. Then when it was evening, the Venerable Ananda rose from the meditation, went to the Blessed One, and after paying homage to him, he sat down at one side and said to the Blessed One, Venerable Sir, on one occasion the Blessed One was living in the Sakyan country, where there is a town of the Sakyans named Nagaraka. There, Venerable Sir, I heard and learned this from the Blessed One's own lips. Now, Ananda, I often abide in voidness. Did I hear that correctly, Venerable Sir? Did I learn that correctly? Attend to that correctly? Remember that correctly. Certainly, Ananda, you heard that correctly, learned that correctly, attended to that correctly, remembered that correctly. As formerly, Ananda, so now, too, I often abide in voidness. If you recall, a couple of days ago, we were talking about the seven types of people, right? One liberated by wisdom, one liberated both ways, and so on and so forth. Well, there's one more person, the eighth type of person, and this is known as the Animitta Vihari. There's a sutta in, I think, the Anguruta Nikaya, where the, uh, there's a Brahma or a Deva named Tisa, Tisa, who comes down and he talks about these seven different types of people. And uh, the monk who's listening to him listens eagerly, and then he goes to the Buddha and tells him, this is what I was told. And then the Buddha says, but did he not tell you about the eighth type of person? And that is known as the Animitta Vihari. Vihari means one who resides, one who abides. And Animitta is the signless, the signless collectedness of mind. So as we go through the sutta, we'll explore what that means. Ananda, just as this palace of Migara's mother is void of elephants, cattle, horses and mares, void of gold and silver, void of the assembly of men and women, and there is present only this non-voidness, namely the singleness dependent on the Sangha of Bhikkhus, so too a Bhikkhu not attending to the perception of village not attending to the perception of people, attends to the singleness dependent on the perception of forest. So there's different ways of understanding voidness. Voidness is a synonym for emptiness. You hear about emptiness in different schools of Buddhism, and usually it's understood as empty of self. So emptiness here is equated with anatta. But here the Buddha is talking about emptiness in terms of what is void of a state. So here he's saying just as this place is void of the elephants and horses and, and so on and so forth, so too a mind can be void of different kinds of elements. So we'll, exp we'll, we'll explore what that means. His mind enters into that perception of forest and acquires confidence, steadiness, and resolution. He understands thus, 
whatever disturbances there might be dependent on the perception of village, those are not present here. Whatever disturbances there might be dependent on the perception of people, those are not here. There is only this amount of disturbance, namely the singleness dependent on the perception of forest. So when a monk enters the forest, it is void of villages and cities and towns. It is empty of these things. It is empty of people. But there is only this, the perception of the forest. He understands. <clears throat> He understands this field of perception is void of the perception of village. This field of perception is void of the perception of people. There is only present this non-voidness, which means that which is there, namely the singleness dependent on the perception of forest. Thus he regards it as void of what is not there. But as to what remains there, he understands that which is present. Thus, this is present. Thus, Ananda, this is his genuine, undistorted, pure descent into voidness. Again, Ananda, a bhikkhu not attending to the perception of people, not attending to the perception of forest, attends to the singleness dependent on the perception of earth. His mind enters into that perception of earth and acquires confidence, steadiness, and resolution. Just as a bull's hide becomes free from folds when fully stretched with a hundred pegs, so too a bhikkhu not attending to any of the ridges and hollows of this earth, to the rivers and ravines, the tracts of stumps and thorns, the mountains and uneven places, attends to the singleness dependent on the perception of earth. So in other words, now he is only perceiving earth, perhaps just the earth element. And so that is void of all of the different details of the earth element. There is just earth. He understands whatever disturbances there might be dependent on the perception of people. Those are not present here. Whatever disturbances there might be dependent on the perception of forest, those are not present here. There is present only this amount of disturbance, namely the singleness dependent on the perception of earth. He understands this field of perception is void of the perception of people. This field of perception is void of the perception of forest. There is present only this non-voidness, namely the singleness dependent on the perception of earth. Thus he regards it as void of what is not there. But as to what remains there, he understands that which is present. Thus, this is present. Thus, Ananda, this too is his genuine, undistorted, pure descent into voidness. Now, he, here it's going to talk about infinite space. So sometimes the interpretation is he sees the earth element and then he takes that as a casino. Now, remember uh, a few days ago we talked about casino coming from the word krishna. Usually it's understood that casino means that one becomes one-pointed on that particular disk of the earth element. But krishna actually means whole or expanded which means he's actually expanding that perception of earth. And now he's going to experience that expansion in the form of infinite space. Again, Ananda, a bhikkhu, not attending to the perception of forest, not attending to the perception of earth, attends to the singleness dependent on the perception of the base of infinite space. His mind enters into that perception of the base of infinite space and acquires confidence, steadiness, and resolution. He understands thus, whatever disturbances there might be dependent on the perception of forest, those are not present here. 
whatever disturbances there might be dependent on the perception of earth, those are not present here. There is present only this amount of disturbance, namely the singleness dependent on the perception of the base of infinite space. He understands this field of perception is void of the perception of forest. This field of perception is void of the perception of earth. There is present only this non-voidness, namely the singleness dependent on the perception of the base of infinite space. Thus he regards it as void of what is not there. So what is not there is the perception of force, the perception of earth. But as to what remains there, he understands that which is present thus. This is present. And what is present? The perception of infinite space. Thus, Ananda, this too is his genuine, undistorted, pure descent into voidness. Again, Ananda, a bhikkhu, not attending to the base, sorry, not attending to the perception of earth, not attending to the perception of the base of infinite space, attends to the singleness dependent on the perception of the base of infinite consciousness. His mind enters into that perception of the base of infinite consciousness and acquires confidence, steadiness, and resolution. He understands thus, whatever disturbances there might be dependent on the perception of earth, those are not present here. Whatever disturbances there might be dependent on the perception of the base of infinite space, those are not present here. There is present only this amount of disturbance, namely the singleness dependent on the perception of the base of infinite consciousness. He understands this field of perception is void of the perception of earth. This field of perception is void of the perception of the base of infinite space. There is present only this non-voidness, namely the singleness dependent on the perception of the base of infinite consciousness. Thus he regards it as void of what is not there. But as to what remains there, he understands that which is present thus. This is present. Thus, Ananda, this too is his genuine, undistorted, pure descent into voidness. So we understand that the base of infinite consciousness, when you perceive that, it is empty of the perception of the base of infinite space. What about the first four jhanas? What's the first jhana empty of? What is it void of? Hindrances. Hindrances. What about the second jhana? Vitaka Vichara, thinking and examining thought. What about the third jhana? Joy. What about the fourth? Sukha, happiness. Again, Ananda, a bhikkhu, not attending to the perception of the base of infinite space, not attending to the perception of the base of infinite consciousness, attends to the singleness dependent on the perception of the base of nothingness. His mind enters into that perception of the base of nothingness and acquires confidence, steadiness, and resolution. He understands thus, whatever disturbances there might be dependent on the perception of the base of infinite space, those are not present here. Whatever disturbances there might be dependent on the base of the, sorry, on the perception of the base of infinite consciousness, those are not present here. There is present only this amount of disturbance, namely the singleness dependent on the perception of the base of nothingness. He understands this field of perception is void of the perception of the base of infinite space. This field of perception is void of the perception of the base of infinite consciousness. There is present only this non-voidness, namely the singleness dependent on the perception of the base of nothingness. Thus he regards it as void of what is not there. 
But as to what remains there, he understands that which is present thus. This is present. Thus, Ananda, this too is his genuine, undistorted, pure descent into voidness. Again, Ananda, a bhikkhu, not attending to the perception of the base of infinite consciousness, not attending to the perception of the base of nothingness, attends to the singleness dependent on the perception of the base of neither perception nor non-perception. Try saying that five times. Perception of the base of neither perception nor non-perception. His mind enters into that perception of the base of neither perception nor non-perception and acquires confidence, steadiness, and resolution. He understands thus, whatever disturbances there might be dependent on the perception of the base of infinite consciousness, those are not present here. Whatever disturbances there might be dependent on the perception of the base of nothingness, those are not present here. There is present only this amount of disturbance, namely the singleness dependent on the perception of the base of neither perception nor non-perception. He understands this field of perception is void of the perception of the base of infinite consciousness. This field of perception is void of the perception of the base of nothingness. There is present only this non-voidness, namely the singleness dependent on the perception of the base of neither perception nor non-perception. Thus he regards it as void of what is not there. But as to what remains there, he understands that which is present thus. This is present. Thus, Ananda, this too is his genuine, undistorted, pure descent into voidness. Again, Ananda, a bhikkhu, not attending to the perception of the base of nothingness, not attending to the perception of the base of neither perception nor non-perception, attends to the singleness dependent on the signless collectedness of mind. His mind enters into that signless collectedness of mind and acquires confidence, steadiness, and resolution. He understands thus, whatever disturbances there might be dependent on the perception of the base of nothingness, those are not present here. Whatever disturbances there might be dependent on the perception of the base of neither perception nor non-perception, those are not present here. There is present only this amount of disturbance, namely that connected with the six bases that are dependent on this body and conditioned by life. He understands this field of perception is void of the perception of the base of nothingness. This field of perception is void of the perception of the base of neither perception nor non-perception. There is present only this non-voidness, namely that connected with the six bases that are dependent on this body and conditioned by life. Thus he regards it as void of what is not there, but as to what remains there, he understands that which is present thus. This is present. Thus, Ananda, this too is his genuine, undistorted, pure descent into voidness. So here the Buddha is talking about the signless collectedness of mind. Some of you have experienced this at some point or another in your meditation. The signless is much, much subtler than the quiet mind. There comes a point where you are with quiet mind and there's no vibration going on at all. But there's this sense of collectedness around the mind. The mind itself is an object. When we talk about the signless collectedness of mind, really that comes from the word anamitta samadhi. Anamitta. So nimitta, which is a sign or an object and a, uh, which is the non, so an objectless meditation, so to speak. What that means is there comes a point where even the quiet mind just fades away and there's just like blank screen that's there. You're not looking at anything in particular. The mind is just aware, looking past things, looking through things. Little things might come up 
But as soon as you see them, they fade away and the mind is just completely, purely empty, void of any object. And this is the signless collectedness of mind. This mind is so purified that there are no vibrations happening. The subtlest vibration that happens here is, known, is, the, is the formation rooted in conceit. The sense of I am, the sense of me, the sense of myself. From there, there can arise craving, there can arise restlessness, there can arise, there can arise aversion, and so on and so forth. So as soon as you see something, you're no longer in that. In the same way, as, long as, you, as, as soon as you perceive, then you're no longer neither perception nor non-perception. As soon as the mind takes something as an object, it's no longer in this signless. The analogy that I use is, it's like you take a flashlight, you switch it on, and you point it to the sky. And when you point it to the sky, it, the light just goes out into space. But it's not landing on anything. As soon as it lands on something, there is an object there. But because it doesn't land on anything, it is just signless, objectless, just pure observing. Not observing anything in particular, just looking. And because eventually the batteries run out, the fuel for that flashlight runs out. That is to say, because there is no more formations arising, because they've been relaxed and let go of. And no fuel of attention is being given to any object in particular, whether they're formations or the sense of I am, or whatever it might be. The battery runs out and the mind's attention stops. And then one is in cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness. So this is a very subtle state. It's not like you have to go there, but this is a state that is accessible once you get more and more developed in the practice. Once you have certain kinds of uh, understanding of each of the jhanas, once you have understanding of the quiet mind, and then see the quiet mind itself as very coarse and let that go. Now that happens on its own when the mind becomes very relaxed and it softens the edges of the mind, softens the edges of one's attention and awareness. And then that just basically fades away. And there is that pure screen that's there. Some people see it as just this blank screen. Sometimes it has an orange hue. Sometimes it has a green hue. Sometimes it looks like static. It's just this screen and nothing in particular. Again, Ananda, a bhikkhu, not attending to the perception of the base of nothingness, not attending to the perception of the base of neither perception nor non-perception, attends to the singleness dependent on the signless collectedness of mind. His mind enters into that signless collectedness and acquires confidence, steadiness, and resolution. His, he understands thus, this signless collectedness of mind is conditioned and volitionally produced. But whatever is conditioned and volitionally produced is impermanent, subject to cessation. So even this signless collectedness of mind is conditioned. It's not the unconditioned. Why is it conditioned? Because there is still a sense of observer there. There's a sense of, there is still an awareness there, which is conditioned by contact with the mind. The mind and the signless state. So it's volitionally produced. What does that mean? There is an intention to relax further and further and further. Volitionally produced, conditioned by that intention. But once the mind realizes that even this is conditioned and therefore impermanent, subject to cessation, the mind loses complete interest in even the signless state. This is where disenchantment and dispassion come into the purview. Here, the mind becomes so disenchanted, so dispassionate, that it doesn't, it's not interested in any formations at all, not interested in any object at all. 
not even interested in the awareness of the signless state of mind. And then there is cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness. When this happens, when he knows and sees thus, his mind is liberated from the taint of sensual desire, from the taint of being, and from the taint of ignorance. This happens when the mind makes contact with the Nibbana element, and there is no grasping on to the joy and relief that's felt as a result of contact with the Nibbana element. Therefore, no more taint of sensual desire, no more taint of the craving for existence or of becoming, and no more the taint of ignorance. He understands when it is liberated, there comes the knowledge it is, liber it is liberated. He understands birth is destroyed. The holy life has been lived. What had to be done has been done. There is no more coming to any state of being. He understands thus, whatever disturbances there might be dependent on the taint of sensual desire, those are not present here. What disturbances are there dependent upon the taint of sensual desire? Craving, the link of craving, sensual clinging, and so on. Whatever disturbances there might be dependent on the taint of becoming, those are not present here. What disturbances might those be? Clinging to existence, craving for existence, bhava, habitual tendencies. <clears throat> Whatever disturbances there might be dependent on the taint of ignorance, those are not present here. Tainted what? Formations. Yes, tainted formations. Formations conditioned by ignorance. Ignorance is gone now. There's complete attention and understanding of the Four Noble Truths. Ignorance is destroyed. And whatever disturbance is dependent upon that, that is, formations rooted in that ignorance, and then further on, the lack of mindfulness when you experience a feeling. All of those disturbances, all of those that are dependent upon ignorance, goes away. There is present only this amount of disturbance, namely that connected with the six bases that are dependent on this body and conditioned by life. He understands thus, this field of perception is void of the taint of sensual desire. Now what he's talking about is that liberated mind. Whatever it's perceiving all the time, it knows that it is empty of the taint of sensual desire. This field of perception is void of the taint of becoming. It's empty of the taint of craving for existence. This field of perception is void of the taint of ignorance. It's empty of ignorance. There is present only this non-voidness, namely that connected with the six sense bases that are dependent on this body and conditioned by life. In, a, in essence, what is remaining is just the five aggregates no longer clung to, no longer conditioned by craving. Thus he regards, the, regards it as void of what is not there. But as to what remains there, he understands that which is present thus. This is present. Thus, Ananda, this is his genuine, undistorted, pure descent into voidness, supreme and unsurpassed. That's the mind of a liberated being, the mind of an arahat, supreme and unsurpassed, completely empty of all disturbances of sensual craving, of the desire to become, and of ignorance. Ananda, whatever recluses and brahmins, that is to say arahats, in the past entered upon and abided in pure supreme, unsurpassed voidness, all entered upon and abided in the same pure, supreme, unsurpassed voidness. Whatever recluses and Brahmins in the future will enter upon and abide in pure, supreme, unsurpassed voidness, 
all will enter upon and abide in this same pure, supreme, unsurpassed voidness. Whatever recluses and Brahmins in the present enter upon and abide in pure, supreme, unsurpassed voidness, all enter upon and abide in this same pure, supreme, unsurpassed voidness. Therefore, Ananda, you should train thus. We will enter upon and abide in pure, supreme, unsurpassed voidness. Thus you should train yourselves. We will enter into the liberated mind. That is what the Blessed One said. The Venerable Ananda was satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. So that's the first sutta. Yes. One very quick one. Yeah. What is this? At every step of the way, there was this pure descent. Mm -hmm. Descent, as opposed to unpure, but rather kind of descent. Pure in the sense that it's not. Um, it's not affected by disturbances. It's just downshift from infinite space to infinite consciousness. It's just gradual, natural progression. And the other one might be connected. Um, so there's, at each step, there was always a whatever disturbance there might be under previous mm -hmm. concepts. These are not here. So just to take infinite consciousness as an example, so when a person is at infinite consciousness, whatever disturbances there might be based on infinite space mm -hmm. are in here. What disturbances would there be from infinite space? The perception of infinite space. So the perception of the concept of that. The experience of infinite space is not there in the experience of infinite consciousness. The experience of infinite consciousness is not present in the experience of nothingness. Okay, so it's not being present means it's not a disturbance to the new stage. Basically, when you go from infinite space to infinite consciousness, you're no longer in infinite space. So you're just in infinite consciousness. When you go from infinite consciousness to <clears throat> nothingness, you're just in nothingness. There's no preceding states of infinite consciousness in nothingness when you're perceiving the base of nothingness. So, the, so what is the sutta really doing? It's starting off with fourth jhana? Or we are going starting out with fourth jhana, yeah. And so what is the point? So the Buddhist, he's really describing the jhanas here. Right. Letting go of each... Right. So he's kind of going backwards through the whole thing and just letting go. So that's, you know, whereas before he said, well, start the first, second, third, and yeah. up, yeah. in a sense. So this is just showing you. There's levels of cessation, right? Yeah. So the jhanas also are levels of cessation. So, so when we, yeah. So that's what you've been talking about, levels of cessation. Yeah. This is kind of the basis of that. Yeah. So I, talk, I asked you guys, what is, uh, what is empty, or what is the first jhana empty of? It's the same way of asking, what ceases in the first jhana? The hindrances. And in the second jhana, what ceases is the vitaka vichara. And then in the third jhana, what ceases is the joy, and so on and so forth. So what you're seeing is these downshifts of the mind. So the, the coarser levels of experience through the different factors of the ambience of each of the jhanas, starts to diminish and cease. So we're saying the, the kasina, the krits, what, what kritsna, yeah. kritsna yeah. is the fourth jhana? Yeah, it's taking you to the fourth jhana, and then you expand that. Okay. And then when you expand that, you're now getting into the experience of infinite space. Yeah. Is there any feeling of perceptions? Mm -hmm. Or is there any perceptions? There's consciousness, so there's feeling and perception also. Consciousness is definitely there. Because like consciousness is that one. But you're perceiving still. You're perceiving that you're 
seen, you know, it's not nothingness because nothingness is a perception of that there is nothing here, but that itself is an object. Here, the signless is like the. It's like everything becomes translucent. All objects become translucent. It's like you're seeing through them rather than looking at them, landing on them. So there's still an Amarupa in signless? Of course. Yeah. yeah. There's an Amarupa even when you're in cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness. If there wasn't, I mean, when we talk about mind and body, they are still present. It says there, in the signless state, there is still the six sense bases dependent upon and conditioned by this life. So the six sense bases, if they are still there, they're dependent upon Nama Rupa and so on. It's just that in cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness, now that's what we're going to go through in a bit, but cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness, the faculties are said to be clear. The reason is right now, when you're listening to my voice, when you're seeing me, when you're experiencing through the six sense bases, those are data packets being received by the six sense bases. Those are impediments in a sense. But when there's cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness, there's absolutely no activity in the sense bases. Which means it, the faculties are clear of the impediments of these sensory data packets. So there, there is a, all of the objects, the signs and all of these things, and then for a moment there's no objects, but perception and consciousness are still working. Right, <clears throat> right. Yeah, there's nothing for it to fuel, to continue, it just ceases, yeah. So in other words, at this point, there's still mental formations, right? But verbal formations and bodily formations have ceased, and we'll understand as we go through. Any other questions? I had a question just about the language. Yeah. Is it like singleness, dependent? Did that just mean like there's one thing? No, singleness here is the unification of mind or it's another way of understanding the collectedness of mind. There is the collectedness of mind. The, the mind is collected around this perception. Okay. Yeah. And then it said like non-voidness? Yeah. Non-voidness means that which is still there. Okay. I know it's a very interesting way that they've talked. There is this voidness, like the, you know, chicken fried chicken. There is the... <laughs> No, so, so voidness means empty of something, right? Okay. So, like, for example, infinite space or infinite consciousness is empty of the perception of infinite space. But there is that which is still present. That's the non-voidness or the non-emptiness or that which is filled with. And what is filled, the mind is filled with the perception of infinite consciousness. Okay. Right? Is that clear? There's still something there. So it's non-void. Non-void means there's still something there. Still something That's right. There. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, if it isn't raining, you can say that it's void and raining. Right. It's not like cosmic. It's just void. But there is that non-voidness, namely the sun. You know. Non-rain. <laughs> Am I understanding it that then the sankaras aren't there or they're suspended? They're suspended, they're ceased. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so the next one, the next two are very short. But they're very interesting and very deep and subtle. So listen and attend closely. Yeah. This is the Samyutta Nikaya 41.7, the Godata Sutta. Now, this is actually an extract. If you guys are familiar with um, 
Majjhima Nikaya 43, where Sariputta is having that conversation with Mahakotita about the different aspects of feeling and then the signless liberation of mind and all of that. This is the same as that particular section, but I'm only going to talk about this section, which is the extraction from there. Oh, the page number is 1325. On one occasion, the Venerable Godatta was l dwelling at Machi Kasanda in the wild mango grove. Then Chitta, the householder, approached the Venerable Godatta, paid homage to him, and sat down to one side. Now, Chitta, the householder, he was known to be an anagami, and he was somebody who knew how to enter the cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness. And he was also somebody who taught the monks because he was very adept in meditation. So sometimes the Buddha would send, him, send them to him to talk about the finer points of how to get into cessation and, and so on. The Venerable Godatta then said to him, as he was sitting to one side, Householder, the measureless liberation of mind the liberation of mind by nothingness, the liberation of mind by emptiness, and the signless liberation of mind. Are these things different in meaning and also different in phrasing, or are they one in meaning and different only in phrasing? There is a method, Venerable Sir, by which these things are different in meaning and also different in phrasing. And there is a method by which they are one in meaning and different only in phrasing. And what, Venerable Sir, is the method by which these things are different in meaning and also different in phrasing? Here a bhikkhu dwells pervading one quarter with a mind imbued with loving kindness. Likewise the second quarter, the third quarter, and the fourth quarter. Thus above, below, across, and everywhere, and to all as to himself, he dwells pervading the entire world with a mind imbued with loving kindness, exalted, vast, measureless, without hostility, without ill will. Does that sound familiar? He dwells pervading one quarter with the mind imbued with compassion, and so on, with the mind imbued with altruistic joy, with the mind imbued with equanimity. Likewise, the second quarter, the third quarter, and the fourth quarter. Thus above, below, across, and everywhere, and to all as to himself. He dwells pervading the entire world with a mind imbued with equanimity or altruistic joy or compassion. Vast, exalted, measureless, without hostility, without ill will. This is called the measureless liberation of mind. Now, there's a way in which they use the word liberation that means the, the liberation of mind which is liberated by the taints and the liberation of mind where the hindrances are no longer present, which is in jhana. So right now, what they're talking about in terms of the measure, measureless liberation of mind is that mind which is imbued with loving kindness or any of the Brahma Viharas and radiates it outward. And what, Venerable Sir, is the liberation of mind by nothingness, here by completely transcending the base of the infinity of consciousness, aware that there is nothing, a bhikkhu enters and dwells in the base of nothingness. This is called the liberation of mind by nothingness. Pretty straightforward. And what, Venerable Sir, is the liberation of mind by emptiness? Here, a bhikkhu gone to the forest, or to the foot of a tree, or to an empty hut, reflects thus, Empty is this of self, or of what belongs to self. This is called the liberation of mind by emptiness. Now, if I remember correctly, Bhante talked about a practice that he did, where he would actually look back and see, where did this thought arise, right? Whose thought is this? And he started to see the emptiness of self of these thoughts, emptiness of self of this body, and so on. And so in that process, one enters the emptiness liberation of mind. Liberation in the sense that it is void 
of any of the hindrances. One is just experiencing anatta there. And what, Venerable Sir, is the signless liberation of mind? Here, with non-attention to all signs. When we say signs, let's say object. Non-attention to all objects. A bhikkhu enters and dwells into the signless collectedness of mind. This is called the signless liberation of mind. This, Venerable Sir, is the method by which these things are different in meaning and also different in phrasing. And what, Venerable Sir, is the method by which these things are one in meaning and different only in phrasing? So now we're talking about the measureless liberation of mind, the liberation of mind by nothingness, the emptiness liberation of mind, and the signless liberation of mind. They're different words, different adjectives, that mean the same thing now as follows, all right? Lust, venerable sir, is a maker of measurement. Hatred is a maker of measurement. Delusion is a maker of measurement. In other words, when there is greed present, when there is hatred present, when there is delusion present, there is a comparing going on, a measuring going on, and that is conceit, mana. Another word for mana is to measure, that is to compare. I am greater than this, or he is better than me, and so on and so forth. For one whose taints are destroyed, these have been abandoned, cut off at the root, made like palm stumps, obliterated so that they are no more subject to future arising. To whatever extent they, there are measureless, measureless liberations of mind, the unshakable liberation of mind is declared the chief among them. Now that unshakable liberation of mind is empty of lust, empty of hatred, empty of delusion. So this is referring to a liberated mind, a mind liberated from the taints. Lust, venerable sir, is a something. Hatred is a something. Delusion is a something. So when we say that, what we're saying is lust is a concept. Greed is a concept. Delusion is a concept. It creates something in the mind. It creates a sense of this is me, this is mine, this is myself. For one whose taints are destroyed, these have been abandoned, cut off at the root, made like palm stumps, obliterated so that they are no more subject to future arising. To whatever extent there are liberations of mind by nothingness, the unshakable liberation of mind is declared the chief among them. That unshakable liberation of mind is empty of lust, empty of hatred, empty of delusion. Lust, venerable sir, is a maker of signs. Hatred is a maker of signs. Delusion is a maker of signs. So objects, objects of repulsion, objects of attraction, objects of identification. When there's greed, hatred, or delusion, there is a sense of this is mine, this is me, this is myself. And so I don't like this. There's a sense of there is that that I don't like. There's a sense of there is that which I like. There is a sense of I am that. And so when there is greed, there is a craving for something. When there is hatred, there is an aversion for something. When there's delusion, there is a identification with something. And that something being an object of one's desire, one's aversion, or one's identification. For one whose taints are destroyed, these have been abandoned, cut off at the root, made like palm stumps, obliterated so that they are no longer subject to future arising. To whatever extent there are signless liberations of mind, so there is a signless collectedness of mind, where there is no object, but there is still the sense of conceit that might arise 
until there isn't. The unshakable liberation of mind, that which is free of the taints, is declared the chief among them. Now that unshakable liberation of mind is empty of lust, empty of hatred, empty of delusion. This, venerable sir, is the method by which these things are one in meaning and different only in phrasing. It is a gain for you, householder. It is well gained by you, householder, in that you have the eye of wisdom that ranges over the deep word of the Buddha. Yeah. Is it 44 or 43? 44? 44. Oh. Well. Yeah. Well, the next suit that we're going to do is actually, an, so, sounds like an, it's, an ex, it's an extract either from 43 or 44 yeah. as well. You'll see what I mean. Any questions before we continue? It's a lot of measure. That's right. Yeah. How, how that's the only way you can compare that. Oh, yeah. he's taller than I am, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. So they're the same in meaning and different phrasing. <clears throat> they're the same in meaning insofar as they're, they're referring. All destroy, they all destroy the taints. No, they're all referring to the mind of a liberated. How to refer to yeah. Liberated, the mind liberated from all the taints. Yes. Like They are different in meaning because you have, okay, so you have, for example, the measureless liberation of mind. Here, liberation is a temporary liberation because it's liberated from hindrances. When you're radiating love and kindness, compassion, joy, or equanimity, there's no hindrances there. So in that sense, it's liberated. When you are in nothingness, there's no hindrances there. In that sense, you're liberated. When you see anatta, the emptiness of self in all things, conditioned and unconditioned too, then there is that emptiness liberation of mind because there's no hindrances there. When you're in the signless state, there's no hindrances there. In that sense, you're liberated from them. So that's how they are different in meaning and different in phrasing. But when they're one in meaning, they're all pointing to that liberation of mind, which is liberated from the taints. Different in name is referring to, or different in meaning and different in phrasing is referring to the different kinds of liberation. Different types of liberation, different categories of liberation. There is the category of the measureless liberation when you are in infinite space, you're sending out loving kindness, compassion, joy, I mean, in any of the formless attainments. When it says that he transcends the base of infinite consciousness, he is liberated by nothingness, meaning now he's in nothingness. That's a liberation of mind. It's a category of a liberation of mind. And then when he sees the anatta, the not-self of every experience, that is a category of liberation of mind. And when he's in signless collectedness of mind, he's in a category of liberation. But when we talk about the ultimate liberation, there's different ways you could call that ultimate liberation by different ways because of the fact that they are free of the taints because the taints create the sense of comparison, create the sense of something there, create the sense of an object. And so in that sense, they have different names for it depending upon how you see it. But they're all referring to the same thing in the second uh, section, pointing to that mind. Right. So I guess I, what I just wanted to I believe I understood that. So the second part, they're pointing to the liberated mind. Mm -hmm. in the first part, they're, talk, they're pointing to a liberated mind, but in the context of liberation from hindrances. Right. Temporary liberation. Temporary liberation from hindrances. Right. Meditative states. Meditative states. Got it. Right. Okay. And the second part, that's the 
That's the mind that's just completely free. It's 43? Oh. Yes. Oh, the Dhamma eye, right? The eye of wisdom. Oh, no, it's the... Is it the eye of Dhamma? Or the... There are five eyes, I think. And I don't know. Ah. Eye. Yeah. Like the eyes, like the... Is it? Oh, there's the eye, that, that's the, there's the divine eye. There's the eye of the Dhamma. There's the... This eye. And then, what else? The eye of Panya, the eye of insight, and so on. But the eye of Dhamma would be one that sees dependent origination, one who underst that which understands dependent origination. So do they mean that every anagami has the eye of wisdom or that he specifically has that ability to... Uh... Yeah, let's read that again. It says here, It is a gain for you, householder. It is well gained by you, householder, in that you have the eye of wisdom that ranges over the deep word of the Buddha. So here it's the eye of wisdom, or I, say, I would say the eye of insight, the ability to penetrate the Dhamma and be able to explain it in a certain way. So it's not typical for all Anagamis? Not necessarily, right. In a sense, he has the analytical knowledges. Right. Sees. Yes. Dependent Yeah. Or you could say the eye of wisdom Dhamma awakens. Chaka. The Dhamma Chaka, the eye of Dhamma. Yeah. This is, I think, Panya Chaka, which is the eye of insight. Yeah. Okay. No. So the eye of Dhamma, I thought I read somewhere, appears at stream entry? Yes. It's awakened because one sees... One sees dependent origination at that point. I just want you to go over instruction one more time. Um, when we are in signless mm -hmm. states, and this formation pops up, you said, do not interact with them. Do not engage with them, yeah. Do not engage with them. So yes. Just, just keep, keep looking. You're not ignoring them. You're not ignoring them. You're aware that they're there. But as soon as your, eyes go, your eye of attention goes there, it's like now you're looking at something. You're looking at a sign. But if you're just seeing through it as being translucent, then the attention doesn't get fueled by that particular formation. Don't, look at them, don't, don't pay attention to them. That's what it is, right? right. Allow them to just... And then they will go because there's no attention given to them. It's like in the very seeing of it, it's going to start to fuel further formations. But the mind automatically just lets go of them at this point. It's just relaxing them. But as soon as you engage with them, now the attention tightens around it. And now you're no longer in the signless because you're taking it as an object. looking in this direction, I mean, they're there because they're there, but the second I actually turn to him, now he's like a full-blown object. So it's the coonless collectedness of mind. So, did I get it right that you said lust, hate, and delusion are concepts? Or they create concepts. Oh, they create concepts. Okay. Makers. Okay. Good, because I was... <laughs> yeah, that's right. They create concepts. It's all... It's all... It's an all... It's the all matrix. matrix. It's, matrix. it's the matrix. That's all it is. It's the coding. I'm going to change my name to Neo. There you go. That's all you got to do. Everybody has to just change their name to Neo, and now you are the one... Neo. 
Okay, moving on. This is Samhita Nikaya 41.6, page 1322. This is known as the Kamabhu Sutta. On one occasion, the Venerable Kamabhu was dwelling at Machi Kasanda in the wild mango grove. Then Chitta, the householder, approached the Venerable Kamabhu, paid homage to him, sat down to one side and said to him, Venerable Sir, how many kinds of formations are there? Now Chitta already knows all of this, but he's just having a dialogue with Kamabhu. There are, householder, three kinds of formations the bodily formation, the verbal formation, and the mental formation. Good, venerable sir, Chitta, the householder, said. So he's acknowledging him. that Okay, you know your stuff. Good. Then, having delighted and rejoiced in the venerable Kamabu's statement, he asked him a further question. But, venerable sir, what is the bodily formation? What is the verbal formation? What is the mental formation? In-breathing and out-breathing householder are the bodily formation. So inhalation and exhalation are one component of the bodily formation. There are other aspects of the bodily formations. When you tighten your arm, what, is, what are you doing? The bodily formations allow you to tighten your fist. Bodily formations allow you to walk. They allow you to breathe. They allow you to do other kinds of functions within the body. But for whatever reason, it's only mentioning inhalation and exhalation. And we'll talk about that a little further. Thought and examination are the verbal formation. So the initial application of thought, or when you are listening to someone and you start to engage with them and speak. Before you speak, there is a process in your mind which starts to formulate what you're going to say and how you're going to express it. The verbal formations allow that process to happen or facilitate that process. Perception and feeling are the mental formations. So the way you perceive things, the way you actually experience everything is dependent upon mental formations. Good, Venerable Sir, Chitta, the householder, said. Then he asked him a further question. But, Venerable Sir, why are in-breathing and out-breathing the bodily formation? Why are thought and examination the verbal formation? Why are perception and feeling the mental formation? Householder, in-breathing and out-breathing are bodily. These things are dependent upon the body. That is why in-breathing and out-breathing are the bodily formation. First one thinks and examines, then afterwards one breaks into speech. So while you're calculating what you're going to say. That is why thought and examination are the verbal formation. Perception and feeling are mental. These things are dependent upon the mind. That is why perception and feeling are the mental formation. Even if you're seeing through the five physical senses, you're, I mean, experiencing through the five physical senses, whatever you're seeing, it's an image created in the mind. Whatever you're hearing is an interpretation of uh, vibrations in the air, picked up by the ear and then interpreted by the mind. Whatever you're tasting, smelling, feeling with your body, all of that is being interpreted by the mind. And therefore, these are all mental. Ultimately, they are mental. That's why in infinite consciousness, even though your eyes are not active, even though your ears are not active, and you still hear flickers, that's happening on a mental level. Because everything, mind is chief. Mind is the forerunner. This is what it is. Everything you're experiencing ultimately is interpreted or experienced by the mind. And this is why they are called mental formation. Saying, good, venerable sir, he then asked him a further question. Venerable sir, how does the attainment of the cessation of perception and feeling in consciousness come about? Householder, when a bhikkhu is attaining the cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness, 
it does not occur to him, I will attain the cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness, or I am attaining the, perception, the cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness, or I have attained the cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness. But rather, his mind has previously been developed in such a way that it leads him to such a state. What is that process of development of mind? <laughs> Six hours going through jhanas, yes. So in other words, you cannot intend to go into cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness until you become an anagami or an arahant, but that's a different case altogether. But in terms of the attainment, there's one is the attainment and one is the determination of going into it. When we're talking about the attainment of cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness, what we're talking about is how does the mind experience it? How does the mind go into cessation? Right? It happens not because you intend it. Instead, you are letting go through the six R process. Letting go of coarser formations that arise in the form of hindrances. Hindrances are nothing but just collected formations. The formation starts off as a little snowflake and it drops on the ground and it picks up and turns into a snowball and then ultimately becomes into this giant snowball, which is the hindrance. So you're letting go of those. And then as you get into quiet mind, now you're dealing with the little snowflakes. You're melting them away with the six R's, right? Letting them go. And so you're ceasing certain formations, bodily formation, verbal formations, bodily formations, and mental formations. And this is how the process of cessation happens. Saying, good, venerable sir, he then asked him a further question. Venerable sir, when a bhikkhu is attaining the cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness, which of these things cease first? ceases first in him? The bodily formation, the verbal formation, or the mental formation? What do you guys think? body. Householder, when a bhikkhu is attaining the cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness, first the verbal formation ceases, then the bodily formation ceases, then the mental formations. Why? Because we're not talking while we're meditating. Right. First in jhana, the first jhana, there's no speaking going on. When you sit down for meditation, no speaking going on. You have the intention to bring up loving kindness. That's the thinking and examining thought. But then in the second jhana, that ceases. Now you have self-confidence and the meditation is flowing. So now the verbal formations cease there. Yes, you can perceive that there is this here, there is that here, there is this here. But that's not verbal, even though it might sound like it's verbal. It's perceiving, it's perception, dependent upon mental formations. Now the bodily formations cease when you get into the fourth jhana because now you're starting to lose contact with the body and now it's all going into a mental state. Now for whatever reason people have said over the ages that in the fourth jhana breathing ceases. Then all dead people are in the fourth jhana. <laughs> but what's going on here is that the mind becomes so calm, so collected, that the body becomes so relaxed that the breathing becomes almost imperceptible, right? So it's not just the in-breathing and out-breathing. It's the all bodily formations related to the feeling in the body. You might still feel contact when it comes to a fly landing on your skin and stuff, but otherwise you're not paying attention to that at all. And if you're not paying attention to that at all, no bodily formations are arising. What about mental formations? When do they cease? In cessation. In cessation. Because mental formations give rise to feeling and perception. When there is a cessation of feeling, perception, and consciousness, that's the cessation of mental formations. Saying, good, venerable sir, he then asked him a further question. Venerable Sir, what is the difference between one who is dead and gone 
and a bhikkhu who has attained the cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness. Householder, in the case of one who is dead and gone, the bodily formation has ceased and subsided. Ceased and never to return again. The verbal formation has ceased and subsided. The mental formation has ceased and subsided. His vitality is extinguished. His physical heat has been dissipated and his faculties are fully broken up. His vitality, this is the Ayu Sankharas. Vitality, that which provides the, the life in the body, the energy in the body. His physical heat, the heat is dependent upon the vitality and the vitality is dependent upon the heat. Right? So when there is heat in the body, there is life. And the heat arises dependent upon the life in the body. Sariputta gives an interesting uh, analogy for this, an interesting image. He talks about the flame. Right? The, the heat of the flame is there and there is the vibrance of the flame, the radiance of the flame that is dependent upon the heat and so on. So that heat is basically the metabolism of the body that continues. That's still there in cessation, as we'll see. Vitality is still there. Faculties are still there. But here the faculties are broken up, meaning now it, this is what is talked about when we talk about the process of death, right? In death, first the heat goes, the fire element goes, the fire element dissipates. Then the air, or rather the uh, air element goes, then the fire element goes, then the water element goes, and then finally the earth element diminishes. And in that process, the other faculties, the sense faculties are broken up. So first the smell goes, then the taste goes, then the sight goes, then the sense of touch goes then the hearing goes, and then finally the mind faculty goes. It breaks up at the breaking up of the body. That's what happens when a person dies, when they are dead. In the case of a bhikkhu who has attained the cessation of perception and feeling, the bodily formation has ceased and subsided. It's stopped. The verbal formation has ceased and subsided. The mental formation has ceased and subsided but his vitality is not extinguished. His physical heat has not been dissipated and his faculties are serene or clear. So in other words, like I was saying earlier, when you are in cessation of perception, feeling and consciousness, there is still this uh, vitality, there is still this energy, there is still the six sense bases that are dependent upon the vitality. They are serene and clear because there's no impediments of sensory data packets going on. Now, when you are in cessation, somebody might think you're dead. That has happened to me. <laughs> when I was in the cave and I was in cessation, uh, my caretaker and my friends saw me in the cave. They tried to take me, they tried to shake me up, right? And they thought something had happened. And so they took me back to his house. And then later on, I think they contacted David and David said, don't worry, everything is fine. You know, just wait for another three days, like I'm Jesus Christ or something. <laughs> but then, yeah, sure enough, I came out. But then the problem was, at least when I came back, I was expecting myself to be in the cave. But I saw all of these lights just like this. And I, th and I thought, I've done it now. <laughs> Somehow... I've gone to the Brahma realms. <laughs> Were they looking for a pulse at the time? I don't think so. They should have been. Or maybe the pulse is very, very faint, if at all. I would be warm, that's true. But they were panicking. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah, just in cessation. I I am not dead. I'm just in cessation. That's all we need to start. Yes. Oh no. <laughs> On the third day he rose again. <laughs> the 
This is the difference between one who is dead and gone, and a bhikkhu who has attained to the cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness. Saying, Good, Venerable Sir, he then asked him a further question. Venerable Sir, how does emergence from the cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness come about? Householder, when a bhikkhu is emerging from the attainment of the cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness, it does not occur to him, I will emerge from the attainment of the cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness, or I am emerging from the attainment of the cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness, or I have emerged from the attainment of the cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness. But rather, his mind has previously been developed in such a way that it leads him to such a state. Now we're talking about the predetermined or the determination. There is an intention, right, that the mind will emerge at, after a certain point or under certain conditions. And so that determination is made and then the mind goes into cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness and then emerges back. That's dependent upon that prior determination. Is that news? Or? No. So, for example, when um, we did the scientific testing, right? I told uh, the scientists when they had me all hooked up to those different, that octopus, you know, on my head. And I said, okay, you're going to see something happen in 10 minutes, right? It's going to dip down, and then after 90 minutes, at the 90-minute mark, something's going to come back up. And exactly at the 10-minute mark, everything ceased, and at the 90-minute mark, everything came back up. That's because of prior determination. There was a determination that after 10 minutes, mind goes into cessation. After, 10, after 90 minutes, there is the arising. So the EEG flatlines? No, the EEG diminishes at the 10 minute mark and then it starts to become more active again the wave is, is elongated or it's yeah so it's not flatlined no because there's still other electrical activity going uh, on okay there's a vitality going on there's the metabolism going on so you know how in the previous sutta it was saying that the signless state is conditioned then wouldn't this imply that that cessation is conditioned by an intention? The prior determination conditions the process of cessation to happen. But in cessation, there's no conditions. It's a cessation of conditions themselves. Feeling is a condition, perception is a condition. And feeling and perception are both conditioned as well. That's why when you come out of cessation, now as we'll get into it, there is the unconditioned, the experience of Nibbana. Saying, Good, Venerable Sir, he then asked him a further question. Venerable Sir, when a bhikkhu is emerging from the attainment of the cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness, which of these things arise in him first? The bodily formation, the verbal formation, or the mental formation? What do you guys think? Probably in Householder, when a bhikkhu is emerging from the attainment of the cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness, first the mental formation arises. After that, the bodily formation, and after that, the verbal formation. Oh, wow. That's oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Oh, what was that? <laughs> oh, what was that? What just happened? And so, saying, good, venerable sir, he then asked him a further question. Venerable sir, when a bhikkhu has emerged from the attainment of the cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness, how many kinds of contact touch him? Householder, when a bhikkhu has emerged from the attainment of the cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness, three kinds of contact touch him. Emptiness contact, signless contact, undirected contact the contact with Nibbāna, that which is signless, no object, that which is undirected, no craving there, that which is empty, completely no self there. 
this initial contact with the Nibbana element then gives rise to feeling, the feeling of joy and relief. The mental formation arises with joy and relief. And then the feeling is, the joy and relief is felt in the body, bodily formation. And then there's, oh wow, the verbal formation. Saying, good venerable sir, he then asked him a further question. When, venerable sir, when a bhikkhu has emerged from the attainment of the cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness, towards what does his mind slant, slope, and incline? Householder, when a bhikkhu has emerged from the attainment of the cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness, his mind slants, slopes, and inclines towards seclusion. Now, this is a, a translation from the word viveka in Pali. So one idea is seclusion, that the mind wants to be secluded. But there's another translation of Viveka, which is discernment or wisdom. Discerning the links of dependent origination. His mind inclines towards seeing dependent origination. Good, venerable sir, Chitta the householder said, then having delighted and rejoiced in the venerable Kamabu's statement, he asked him a further question. Venerable Sir, how many things are helpful for the attainment of the cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness? Indeed, householder, you are asking last what you should have asked first. But still, I will answer you. For the attainment of the cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness, two things are helpful. Serenity and insight. Twim. Samatha Vipassana. Questions? That is a smart householder. He is, yes. <laughs> Who is this guy? <laughs> Who's this guy? <clears throat> oh, you had a question first. That's okay. Uh, All right. Go ahead. I, I thought it's the same question. I, I was. I remember Bhante once said something like, "If someone, if, if someone attained the Ibana, became an arahant, that, that you know his or her mind would be so pure that they couldn't stay in the world anymore. They would have to. <coughs> they would have to go to you know join a monastery, basically, you know, a nunnery, or, uh, or the, you know they had like just seven days to do something like that, or they would die, or something like that." Does that, um, I'm just wondering, how does that square with this? Because it seems like this, if the person came out of cessation, like if, you know, if Chita had a, you know, had a, had a teen Ibana, I imagine, you know, it would be okay. You know, no, but stream enters attain Ibana too, right? Yeah. And uh, so do Sakadagamis and Anagamis. Right, you don't have any more. There's no need. You're just the seclusion is in your mind, not not in the physical world. I think. Yeah, you you lose it. I mean, you completely lose interest in things like supporting yourself, for example. And so that's why you then go into the homeless life. You go into becoming a monastic because that's where you get your requisites. Because you just don't have any interest in doing this or that. Your mind is completely at peace. It's not looking for this or that or another. And you want to teach and let people know, but then you get supported. And you get supported as a teacher, or whatever it might be. Yeah, some arahats have the analytical knowledges, and some arahats are saying, I'll just mop up the place, you know. <laughs> a solitary arahat. <laughs> Leave me alone. I just want to be in my cabin. 
<laughs> yeah, but feed me. <laughs> Just leave it outside the door. I, I never, you know, I never saw any indication of that because the Buddha was always, oh, you're an arhat now. Okay, you go there. Right. You go there. Uh, yeah, I never saw. That. They, they don't go away because they're just completely right. Okay, what you need. And even if they're not inclined to teach, but you ask them a question because of the experience that they've had, they'll be able to talk to you from experience. Yeah. So it'll be like they're teaching you anyway. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> he didn't ask the questions that I wanted. <laughs> no, my question is, uh, first of all, it's like a, when, we do, when do you do this determination? Like before the sitting, So, I mean, the way the exercise of the determination starts off is you start off with the first jhana, then you move on to the second jhana. You do certain kinds of things. You get into the first jhana for a certain time period, you come out of it, and you do like micro jhanas. It's like five seconds in that jhana and coming out, and 10 seconds and so on. And you do that with each of the jhanas. And then you finally do that with cessation. So it's say these are all preparatory exercises leading to towards determining if you can just get into cessation. Now, I think the traditional understanding within certain communities is that you go all the way up to nothingness and you come out of nothingness and you say, okay, now when I attain neither perception, non-perception, then mind will go into cessation. But you can just go into cessation just like that. No. Oh, oh, there was two of them. Yeah. Mine well, is, well, if, if you don't determine and you go into cessation, can you be... Um, um, you won't get stuck for more than a few minutes, no, 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 seconds. I mean, can, can somebody bring you up? Oh, no, no, no. But even then, if you go into it, right, like where you do have an attainment, it's only for like a split second. It's not even for a couple of seconds. It's just like that. Oh. Wait, wait, you even know time. Yeah, you wouldn't even know how long you were in it for. It's just like, it might have been there for a minute or it might have been there for a split second. So yeah. there's a fear that comes up when people first experience cessation and then later on they're like, oh, what if I get stuck? <laughs> okay. But as far as I know... I've never heard of anybody getting stuck in cessation. They wouldn't even know. Right. Oh, can you shake them out of it when they're in it? But like, it would be so brief that there wouldn't be no point having to, yeah. Right. You would only notice it when you have that, oh, wow, like, oh, what just happened? And that was just for that split moment. Yeah, it seems that you need a determination to actually keep you in it. To keep you in it, yeah, you need a determination. Yeah. So for those of you who might be afraid to go into cessation, <laughs> don't worry. You're not going to get stuck in it. Don't worry, we'll hold a funeral for you. <laughs> It'll be great. We'll have fireworks. We'll have fireworks. There you go. You won't be there, so they're going to be cheap fireworks. <laughs> so I have a related story that people might be interested in. At the end of the last retreat, a person came up to me and told me a story about this. Mm -hmm. And the person said, This was a great retreat. Um, something prompted this, and uh, I was going in and out of cessation for most of the time, mm -hmm. and having these repeated <laughs> experiences, and it was great. <laughs> <laughs> there was no concern in that person's voice whatsoever. Yeah. And the smile 
never left. Right. Yeah. I know who you're talking about. Yeah. So, any more thoughts about, you know, say Anagami can go into a cessation, but yet not attain arhatship and not have another experience of Nibbana? Yeah, I mean, we had a brief discussion about this a little bit, which is, uh, you know, I, I would say not every cessation or every Nibbana experience is going to result, or not, what would be the best way to put it? It would be like, not every cessation would result in a path attainment or fruition attainment. It's the Nibbana element followed by it that can result in the breaking of the fetters or weakening of the fetters. But it seems like when they come in and out of cessation, they are allowing the mind the ability to weaken that fetter. Right? But then the Nibbana experience is the one that completely rusts it out. Because in that moment of Nibbana, the mind is utterly pure, right? It's completely unfettered, completely untainted. For that brief moment of Nibbana, everybody is, let's say, an Arahant, because there's nothing going on. It's completely pure. But then when you hold on to that experience and say, oh, that was great, I want more of that, the craving arises again, or the identification with it arises again. And so certain fetters are destroyed. Like in stream entry, we know that the, the fetter of self you the fetter of doubt, and the fetter of clinging to rites and rituals are gone. Because you've experienced it for yourself and you realize, oh, this is an impersonal process. And this is the way leading to Nibbana, so I don't have any more doubt about it. And no clinging, or, uh, no rites and rituals is going to take me there. So there's no longer any clinging to it. But then there's the weakening of... Um, sensual craving and aversion for the Sakadagami. So they have an experience of Nibbana, and the joy is again there, but it might not be as that much of a fireworks as before. It'll still be there. The relief will still be there. But then with the Anagami, there's like, there's a lot of equanimity actually there. There's a lot of like balance there. Because now there's no craving going on. But there's there's joy of the Dhamma. There's clinging to the Dhamma still there. And then with the Arhat, when the, the contact with the Nibbana element happens, there's no grasping onto any experience. It's just seeing things as they actually are. So because there's no fuel in the form of grasping, none of the taints can arise because those taints will arise dependent upon fuel of craving or identification or views or ignorance or whatever it might be. But that's not, no, no action. When the feeling arises, no action, mental, verbal, or physical, leads to craving for that. It's just seeing things as they are, but completely pure. So nothing fetters it anymore. So the conceit goes away, and therefore the restlessness goes away, the craving for jhana, craving for formless states goes away, and obviously ignorance is destroyed. Well, it seems like cessation there. Right. And there's some sort of, you know, it's conditioned. Right. Nibbana not conditioned. Right. So there must be something. So, You're I, saying between cessation and Nibbana or after okay. Nibbana? Okay, so what, is, so what is the difference between cessation and Nibbana? Cessation is a cessation of all conditions. Yeah. And Nibbana, Nibbana is the unconditioned state that results. Well, we can't say results because then it says it's conditioned. But the nibbana, the, the nibbana element itself has no craving in it. It has no object that it perceives. It's just completely unconditioned. But the cessation yeah. itself is not, is not unconditioned. It's the, the cessation is the process in which all things cease. And then when everything comes back on... There is the unconditioned. So the unconditioned is there in cessation. The unconditioned is there. But there's, there's contact made once the emergence from cessation happens. Oh, it's, it's another state <laughs> right. born of cessation. Right. Or to say the Nibbana element was already there. Yeah. It's just now the contact was made after the mental formations arose. 
Dhamma Chakra seeing the links of dependent origination going, whoa, nobody's gone. Yeah. So in the order of what we're talking about, there's cessation, then there's contact with Nibbana, and then there's the seeing of the links. The reason is because we talk about the contact with the Nibbana element, that is to say, the first contact that happens, the mental contact. Then the formations arise dependent upon that contact, and the formations that arise dependent upon that contact are pure for that first time they come up. That's why you see whatever it is that you see. But then after that, there's the joy and relief. That joy and relief is conditioned. And that joy and relief, if taken and clung to, results in the refettering of the mind. Formations depend upon the condition of Nibbana. Wow. Pure formations. Pure, yeah. yeah. Void of any craving. I was listening to a talk by uh, Tanisaro Bhikkhu, and he said a few things about Nibbana I wonder if you'd agree with. He said, it's, there's a consciousness, but it's not one of the... He said, there's, like a con there's some kind of consciousness there and some kind of happiness, but it's not a feeling, and the consciousness isn't one of the links. And he also said it's technically always right here, it's technically always right right here. But it's not something we've ever experienced before unless you've gone through this process. That's, uh, that's, that's the way I mean, Burmese monks and I think it's come from Arizona, if, if I don't mistake yeah. you know? I wonder if he's referring to the Fala Samapati, though. That's what I'm wondering, yeah. Like, Fala Samapati is one. And another one is like, in, uh, I think it's come from Abhidhamma, it's always believed that, you know, all in here is um, Nama Rupa, right? And Nibbana. Nibbana is we just don't experience this, it's always here. Just like a, uh, when you light the candlelight in a dark room, you know, light appear and darkness disappear at the same time. That's mm -hmm. how. The experience of that. Yeah. Well, we think about when we're going through the process of the jhanas, right? What we're doing is we're deconditioning the mind. So we're removing conditions. Yeah. It's the cessation of conditions, which include conditioned feeling and perception, and perception and feeling themselves being conditions. So that process of cessation is where all conditions cease. Right? All feeling, all perception, all consciousness dependent upon formations cease. Because even in that uh, moment of cessation, all sankharas also cease. Which then what's remaining is the unconditioned, because there's nothing there to condition it. It's just unconditioned. But now you have to be very careful when you use language like this, because then it's like, oh, so nibbana is, yeah. is like a, it's it's a substratum, yeah. you know. That's not the case here. What we're saying is, nibbana is the unconditioned in the sense that there's no conditions present, which allows the mind then to see dependent origination as it arises, pure, pure dependent origination. That is to say. Formations void of craving, consciousness void of craving, nama rupa, and then contact. So what happens is okay. So what happens is cessation, contact with the nibbana. That's the first contact that arises. That's unconditioned. Then the formations that arise are the mental formations that allow you to experience feeling of joy and relief. Then there is the joy and relief that's felt in the body bodily formations arise, and then there's like, wow, what was that? That's the verbal formations, right? So now the feeling and the perception of that is experienced in the first set of dependent origination. Then when the mind says, wow, I really like that, inclines to it, then the next set of formations, if clung to, 
are now fettered again by the craving for that experience. But if there's no clinging to the Dhamma, then the formations that do arise are not rooted in the craving. So in this snap, there's like so many dependent origination cycles going on. So in that moment of contact with Nibbana, right, the experience of Nibbana, you see pure dependent origination, that is pure formations, pure consciousness, and then the feeling, right, as a result of that contact. And then if that feeling is clung to, then there's formations that are rooted in that clinging. And then you still have some fetters there, some taints there. What are these, right? Because it's so fast that, you know, I can't tell this is a new formation. Right. So, and I, I don't know, am I right? Like, uh, I mean, a after you have that attainment, usually the mind is just like filled with pure energy, right? It's just like, it doesn't want to look back. It's just feeling the joy and the relief. Right. But if you do have an experience like that, it would be useful for you to use the mind to reflect back on what happened. That way you have better clarity on seeing dependent origination. You see it regardless at some point or another. But if you look back, you might have better clarity on what you just saw. Yeah. Better understanding. Yeah. On, yeah. No question about some of the mechanics here. Yeah. So the first part is, you know, from from where I am now to the experience of cessation, <clears throat> if you will, um, I am in the stream of dependent origination, right? Uh, I'm rooted in ignorance. My formations are rooted in ignorance. My consciousness, my contact, all of it, right? Um, so I'm curious, you know, where is the free will, if you will, you know, to even start making a different choice because even my contact is has been shaped. And I know we, we've, we've talked about um, that at the point of contact where feeling comes up, that's when you can choose, if you will, right? But it seems like even making that choice, it has to come from some prior contact or formation that's already set and also still part of this dependent origination stream. So that's the first part. So assuming we, you know, we get through that, I have the experience of cessation, I come out of cessation. And here, I'm trying to work out the answer and I would appreciate your input here. So, I come out of cessation, I make contact with uh, the Nibbana element. Um, <clears throat> so that's the first contact, uh, formations arise. Um, if they're pure, you know, if formations are pure, I experience the you know, joy and relief. And if there's craving, Right, then you kind of keep going, right? You have to keep going, right? Obviously not an Arahant. So where does that craving come from? And the reason I ask is because I was imagining like dependent origination, almost like the cartoons, you're running along and you go off the cliff. Right? Once you hit cessation, you're off the cliff, you're off this causal link, off this causal train. I'm now off of this. Make contact with the you know unconditioned. So, there are no, I'm not part of these links, how can this craving still be there? And so then I thought, well, maybe it's because of the fetters, right? The fetters are still there. Uh, so you have this moment, you know, you're in the unconditioned, but at the end of the day, your, minds are, your, your mind is still fettered. So that's where the craving comes from. But then, for the anagami, like how is the, they don't have craving anymore, right? So, but the anagami still runs the risk of coming into contact with nibbana and saying, "Oh, but it's the risk of coming in contact with nibbana." Did you say that? Did you say the risk of coming into contact with nibbana? So, they have the opportunities. The opportunity. To contact with nibbana, right? But the, do a cost-benefit analysis right. before you. Do I really want to do this, you know? Because I, because I really love nibbana, right? Um, but. 
come into contact with Ibana, so two cases, right? The anagami who comes into contact with Ibana, you know, fetters are broken, no craving arises, not even for that experience itself. They're done. Yeah. But then there's a second anagami who has that experience, but they're still, I mean, we can't call it craving because that fetter was released already, but still something holds this person back to still be in a dhamma. Where does that come from now? Okay. Does that make sense? So what we're saying here is you have contact with Nibbana. There's the experience of Nibbana. The mind touches Nibbana. And then the feeling that arises is conditioned by that experience, right? That's all the joy and relief that you experience. But contact also gives rise to formations. So when we're talking about dependent origination, right? Contact is one of those things that gives rise to intention, gives rise to formations, gives rise to feeling, gives rise to perception, and so on and so forth. So the next set of formations that come up are pure and allow the mental feeling of joy and relief to happen. Now, dependent upon that, if the mind grabs onto that feeling of joy, then the next set of formations as a result of that choice will be fettered. But before that, all those formations that arose were unfettered. And what if it doesn't grab onto that? Then they will not be fettered. And then one is an arahant. Oh, so one, so it's either or. Right, so if there is that clinging to the Dhamma, which is, there's no lust there, there's no aversion there, but there is, I am experiencing this, and I enjoy the Dhamma. There's, see, for the Anagami, there's equanimity there. The first joy that you experience as a stream enterer is just ama amazing because it's, you've never experienced this joy before. And then eventually, then you, when you become an anagami, there's actually more equanimity than joy there. There's more balance there. Okay, so let's say the uh, saptagami. Okay, there's still some. I mean, some joy is so there. Between. Yeah. So then, is it when that first stream of dependent origination comes by and there isn't a grasping onto it. Right. Um, then what? Does that person then... So you're saying somebody who attains anagami? No. Yeah, would then become an anagami. Would then become an anagami. There the joy instead is just seen as it is, which is just an impersonal process. It just happens automatically as a result of continually six Ring. So this process of craving or not craving, this process of clinging or not clinging to it, is dependent upon how much right effort you've applied prior. That's why one keeps saying that your choices are inclining towards either craving or not craving, depending upon how many times you've been mindful of that and six R'd it. The more you six R it, having that sharp, clear, clear mindfulness, the more automatic your choice is to not crave for something. So you six R all the way to arahatship. So to build on what you're saying, if I understand correctly, so the, the challenge for, for a stream mentor, right, hasn't done this long enough, Right, so they have this experience in Nibbana and experience of joy and relief. They may not even realize that they're clinging and craving because sometimes people right. experience stream entry and don't know they experienced it. So, but, but they feel so good and they're like, wow, I feel amazing. And automatically, yeah. there's a conceit of, ah, I had this experience, this was wonderful, this was awesome, I, I enjoyed it, blah, blah, blah. I want to do this again, even though they don't know what it is. So it's just mm -hmm. automatic. But as they, as they continue up the in up the liberation chain, um, the more they, the more a person six hours and starts to incline the formations towards the wholesome, to incline towards not craving, towards letting go, the next time these experiences happen, they're more likely to not 
But that happens automatically. Right. They're, right. So there, there won't be, at that moment, they're not choosing anymore. It's like, whatever choices you have made... Now Previous. You to, you know, right. Now the fruition of that karma, the intention that you had, is not coming into, for, uh, into the, the forefront at that point in time. There's this question of... Uh, Araha sees dependent origination four times. Anagami three times. Two times, one time. How do you see that? I think uh, one way to look at it is that in, in the case of the stream enterer, they see something, but they're not able to fully comprehend what they saw. But I will say that afterwards, a stream entry can go back to the suttas, and then even in their own daily life, start to see dependent origination. Like, oh, here is the contact, here is the feeling, here is so and so. And then once you get more clarity on this in the second time around for the Sakadagami, you might see more links. Like in the case of uh, Ananda, he saw only certain links. He didn't see six sense bases. He didn't see uh, formations. He didn't see ignorance. But he saw certain links. Uh, in the case of the Sakadagami, they would probably have more clarity on dependent origination. So they might see uh, those links and kind of even be able to say, oh, that was probably the formations. There's an intuition that comes up. And with the Anagami, it's much clearer. With the Arahant, it's like they can, see, they can like, it's like in that moment of seeing, it goes, it, this is going to sound very much like science fiction, but it goes beyond kind of the notion of time. Because you're just seeing like almost in slow motion, or the perception of it is in slow motion that you're like, oh, here is the formation, here is the consciousness, here is the nama rupa, here is the contact, and so the six sense bases, here is the contact. Not only that, but with the arhat, they can go backward and see, oh, this is where this was, this is where this was. So when we talk about the forward order and the reverse order, the arhat sees that forward and reverse upon reflection. So as to one time, two times, three times, four times, that might happen, but uh, I think experientially, not all the time. I mean, depending upon the people that we've spoken to, probably not all the time. The, the links themselves are kind of a flow of experience, right? So these, these concepts we're placing on them, that there's distinct divisions. Yeah. This is the mind's way of perceiving what, it's, what is actually happening. Right. That's why for some people, formations are seen as dashes, or they're seen as lines, or they're seen as circles, or uh, they're seen as like umbrellas, or whatever it might be, just little things that they see, circles and ringlets and things. But that's just the way that that particular mind is perceiving or interpreting what is happening in the flow of dependent origination. So it's seeing reality as it is dependent upon how mind perceives it. That's why the Buddha says, as to that ananda, it's dependent upon their faculties. Yeah, like for them, for, so for the stream enter, they're entering the stream and the stream is a little muddy. They can see the rocks and they can see a little fish and they can see a little algae or this or moss or whatever. A little bit, but they can't really catch it. It's just like a little muddled. And with the Sakadagami, they see a little bit more. And then upon reflection and upon their experience, then they're able to say, oh, that was the moss. Oh, that was the rock and everything. And with the Anagami, it becomes even clearer. And then with the Arahat, they can actually swim upstream and say, oh, that was where the rock is. 
They know exactly this is where the rock is, this is where the moss is, this is where the salmon is, this is where the whatever it might be. So it just becomes clearer and clearer and clearer. Just to make sure that I was understanding right, but so like the Buddha will give different amount of links and different suttas. So I guess what I was no. just confirming is are there clear delineations between the links or it seems like those are just concepts we're placing on a flow of experience where there's no clear delineate. I mean, clearly there is a, a distinction between, say, feeling and perception, but it seems like at some point it's arbitrary where we place the divider lines between link or what we're calling a link. Is that right? No, there is, a, there is a pretty good delineation point. It's just that as it becomes clearer, you start to see those delineations. So as you get deeper and deeper in the practice, and then as you get higher and higher attainments, you actually do see, oh, here is the contact, oh, here is the feeling. But however you perceive it is just dependent upon your faculties. But you have a clear vision of those delineations. So why did the Buddha... Well, I think there's some suttas, like you're talking about, yeah. where he starts, say, with consciousness, 15, where he just, he doesn't... Right, he says, with consciousness, there's Nama Rupa. Yeah, so, but the formations is missing. The formations is but missing, right. I think he's, it's his audience. He's talking to the audience, like uh, Ananda, at that point, had been, become a stream enterer. So he was not able to delineate where the ignorance was. He was not able to delineate where the formations were. Oh, this is where the six sense bases were. So those three particular links are not mentioned in Diganikaya 15 which we went through a few days ago. And for the reason being is the Buddha is speaking to what Ananda understands then. At his level. At his level. I see, yeah. And then there's another one where sometimes the later links are grouped into bigger categories. Yes, yeah. but yes. But just because he's just yeah, right. summarizing or something. And then if you go to Majjhima Nikaya 9, you have Sariputta, who goes not even not only just through all 12 links, but he says even before that, there's the taints. And he says the ignorance is dependent upon the taints, and the taints are dependent upon the ignorance. Is the ignorance an actual link? Because I feel like it's not really a link, but the setting, the the contamination of the other things. I mean, consciousness and formations are really things, but I feel like ignorance is like the paint that paints all the other things. <coughs> it's a condition. Okay. Right. So it's not really a link as such as the other links. But it arises dependent upon the fact that one is not able to see. Yeah. And so it... It's seen as a link because it's saying this is what conditions formations. Ignorance, dependent upon ignorance, these formations arise. Meaning dependent on the fact that one does not see or experience or ignores the Four Noble Truths, then certain formations will arise. Because you just don't know. I mean, a baby seeing a flame might put their finger in the flame, but they don't know. They don't know. Ignorance. So that's why I was saying, I mean, obviously this is not in the suttas, but I'm just terming it this way. There's the mundane ignorance and the super mundane ignorance. The mundane ignorance is that you don't know that you don't know, right? You don't know about the Four Noble Truths because you've never heard about them before. But the super mundane is you've heard about them before, but you don't remember them. The lack of... Or you ignore them. Right. The consciously incompetent person. Right. So technically, like, six are ignorance. Like, right? Like, it's only to the formation. Yes, six R's are deconditioning the formations of ignorance. Every time you six R, you are mindful 
which means you're remembering to observe how mind's attention moved. When you do that, you're using your ability to use Yoni Somani Sakara to see things as they are, that they are, in, they are impermanent, not worth holding on to, and therefore not considered to be self. Every time you see it, you don't project upon it, you just see it as it actually is. Ignorance starts to, the paint chips away. As until the. As it seems like a twofold to me. One is the mindfulness, one is the yoni samanisikara. Right. You know, otherwise. The mindfulness enables yeah. the yoni samanisikara. Yeah. yeah. Otherwise, you know, mindfulness alone um, can be, it could be a wrong mindfulness. Yeah. Wrong mindfulness would be, yeah, I'm eating, yes. I'm paying attention to how I'm eating, yes. right? Yeah. That's wrong mindfulness. Yeah. Right. But mindfulness here is like, oh, the mind was distracted and is taking this personal, but I see this as being impersonal and letting it go. When you're using right effort, which is the six R's, that allows you to be uh, utilizing right mindfulness. That's why it is in that particular sequence. The Eightfold Path is in that particular sequence. Right effort leads to right mindfulness. Right mindfulness leads to right collectedness. Satisfied? Delighted? Let's hear some merit. May suffering ones be suffering free. May the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief. And may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power, share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.